for, for more background, uh, I started out uh, at Harvard. I went to Harvard College, graduated in, in 85 from Quincy House. Is there any Quincy people here? Um, I went and did graduate work for five years at Stanford um, University in population genetics and you know, thoroughly expected that I was going to be an academic and work in a lab uh, for the rest of my life. And what I found was I was just very dissatisfied with the, the questions that we could answer. Uh, we could ask great questions, but our ability to get to the answers was very, very frustrating and felt limiting, felt rather isolated with that. Um, it was you know, very easy to be the world's expert in something incredibly narrow because no one else was looking at it. And so then I decided to just make a big change of course. And I came back to Harvard, I uh, went to Harvard Law School, graduated in 93. And again, I, I wasn't quite sure what I was going to do. I was casting about, I was in a joint degree program with uh, the Kennedy School of Government, thinking maybe I could apply my science learning to you know, FDA issues or maybe centers for disease control because I did a lot of modeling of genetic systems. Um, or maybe uh, work for like Senate staff, something like that, on a committee that was involved with, you know, environmental release of genetically modified organisms. That sounded kind of interesting to me, um, and a little scary. Um, and then as a just a lark, um, a third-year law student. When I was a first-year law student, found out there was a, you know, a biologist in the first-year class, and, and she asked me to lunch and told me what she was doing, and she was a uh, working at a patent firm in Boston and doing intellectual property, which were two words which I had never before put together in my life. I, I really had heard of patents, but I didn't really know much at all about them. So I went on an interview and found that uh, everyone I interviewed with was a former scientist who had gone to law school um, and, and went into, into patent law. And I thought, what the heck, this, this sounds good. I'll try it for a summer. Um, I loved it. Uh, it was really fascinating work. Um, it allowed me to apply the science learning to sort of the business context, there's the government context to it, there's the court context to it, and do something that was very concrete and applicable um, as opposed to what I was doing, which was theoretical population genetics. And here I was like working with people who are actually building companies and making stuff and trying to cure diseases and, and, and get the money necessary, the, the financing to build those companies and to navigate the, the legal complexities. And I've been doing it ever since. Um, I'm now a partner at uh, Wilmer Cutler Pickering Hale and Door, which we mercifully abbreviate as Wilmer Hale. And um, I'm in the IP department there. And about half my time is working with companies and inventors on developing new IP, developing new, new patent applications, and, and fighting with the patent office to get those. Uh, another good chunk of my time is spent working with uh, investors who are trying to figure out whether or not they should invest in companies, whether or not the companies have appropriately protected their IP position and it's a safe investment. Um, and uh, some portion of my time is split up with licensing arrangements and, and um, rarely litigation uh, when, that, when that's necessary. So if I can now get a sense of, of, of who you are, um, so how many people here are like mostly interested in, in medical devices, anything from a bone screw to an artificial heart? Okay, that's a good number. And then what about something like uh, small molecule drugs? Okay, we've got some, all right, some chemists here. What about large molecules, biologics? Okay, all right. Um, what about things like discovery platforms, research tools for identifying, you know, targets to screen for uh, new inhibitors or activators of, of things, okay? And then what about um, manufacturing platforms like protein expression systems or cell-based systems? Okay, a couple of that on that. What about bioinformatics? Okay, all right. Um, all right, so we've got, we've got a smattering here. Um, for, for those of you who might be interested in, in the recent Supreme Court opinions, uh, the ACLU versus Myriad and Mayo versus Prometheus, I think those questions are going to be less interesting to most of the people in the room. So can we do, save those for the end? Um, and during the question period, I can take those, or I'd be happy. I could talk for hours about those two opinions. They're dreadful opinions, but um, I, I don't think it's of general interest. So I'd, I'd ask you to try and uh, hold off on that. Um, so, so health science or life science companies are really just very, very different than the tech startups. 
And when I started out in the field, the, the, the VCs were jumping into biotech the way they had jumped into high tech. And high tech's easy. You know, you, you hire, you know, 20 recent graduates from the institution down, downstream. You lease about 1,000 square feet of space. You get some used furniture from Peabody Office Furniture. You get some you know, computers. You network them together. And you give them six months to come up with a product. And if they don't, you pull the plug. And you fire everybody. You return the furniture. You don't renew the lease. I mean, the, the risk was pretty low. And if you had 10 people all working on one, one piece of software, they might actually do something in six months. And the VCs jumped into biotech that way. And they'd say, here's $3 million, go develop a drug. And they were shocked to find out that it didn't work that way. And there was sort of a, a first boom in biotech funding, and then this big crash as the, the VCs got totally disenchanted with it. And now we've in sort of a more realistic phase where people recognize these very big differences, that, that life science companies, health companies require much, much bigger capital investments. Laboratories are much more expensive spaces than you know, the garage where you can write software. Um, development times, much, much longer. Um, you know, starting with your cell-based assays, perhaps, and going all the way up through animal studies, and if you are lucky enough, getting into clinical trials with something. Um, or even if it's you know, genetically modified corn that you're working on, there's lots of generation time. There are things that are, that are very slow in the process. Um, a lot more uncertainty in the R&D. Uh, a capacitor is a capacitor and will always behave as a, compa as a capacitor. But when you, let's say, transfer a protein from one species into another, God only knows what it's going to interact with. And you've got a lot more uncertainty uh, as you move from a cell-based assay to a whole animal-based assay. What works in the cell may not work in the whole organism or may be toxic to the organism. So all the way up until the end, Drugs, drugs going into phase three clinical trials, the majority are still failing after years and years and years. So you've got uncertainty right up to the end. Um, commercialization costs are a lot higher also. Um, it's very cheap once you've got your software to you know, burn a whole bunch of CDs and put them in plastic boxes and ship them out. Uh, the manufacturing um, at, at, for most biotech drugs, biologics, small molecules, whatever it might be, um, much, much higher, or even uh, medical devices. And, and, and you know, medical devices, you've got the, the, the same you know, issue until you start actually implanting them into people. It looks good on, on the model or on the cadaver, but when you try it in, in situ in a, in, a, in a person, you don't really know how well they'll work. Um, regulatory burdens are enormous for all of the, the, the health sciences, diagnostics as well as pharmaceuticals. So the FDA will be scrutinizing everything. That's not a problem in high tech. If you, know, the, if you buy your cell phone from Radio Shack and it turns out to be a piece of junk, well, too bad, you wasted your money. Uh, the government's not gonna come in. Um, but you're not gonna be able to sell a junky drug. Um, now, on the good side, you've got much longer product lifetimes. Um, and this is hopeful because you might actually get back some of your investment for all of this work that you're doing. If you do find a drug that gets FDA approval or you've got a good medical device, um, you know, an insulin delivery system um, that, that, that works very well, gives you good controlled levels, um, that could be on the market for 10 or 15 years easily uh, before it gets replaced. In the high-tech world, things are obsolete in a couple of years, which actually makes patent protection questionable in those areas because the time it takes to get a patent is so long that it, the, the product might be obsolete before it issues. Um, and then also the, the, the health science startups have different exit strategies generally. Um, a lot of the high-tech companies think they're going to do an IPO, and they can do it because if you're burning CDs or you're making you know, gadgets that you can you know, outsource to, to India or China, you, you can get that done and you can sell those parts or you can sell the software, that's easy. Um, it's much more uh, common to see M&A as, as an exit strategy uh, in health sciences. Um, you want to be acquired by Big Pharma or some other big company, that's your way to cash out. You don't want to develop the sales force and you don't want to be doing clinical trials if, you're, if you started you know, as a bench science company. And I don't have it down here, but the most common exit strategy, 
want to have a guess for that, health sciences, is bankruptcy. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> or get used to it if you want to be an entrepreneur. Um, let's see. So in your strategy, just some basic questions to keep in mind um, when you're starting out. Know what you actually have in terms of intellectual property. And I want to emphasize not what you hope to have in the future. You've got a plan. That's fine. But you don't get patents on plans. You're supposed to get patents on inventions which have been conceived and, and at least constructively reduced to practice, which is a buzz term meaning you've got it formed in such a fixed concrete idea and know so well how you're going to do it that you can write it down and someone of ordinary skill in your art, whatever your area of expertise is, could read it and do it with a reasonable expectation of success. That's how well developed it has to be in order for you to get a patent. So it's not, you know, we're going to do X, then we're going to do Y, then we're going to do Z. If you haven't done them, you're not going to get a patent on it yet. Um, know what you need for your company. So know what you have, know what you need. Do you need rights that other people have? Um, it may turn out that you, you, know, you set up shop and then you realize that there's someone who has a patent that control some essential element of what you're trying to develop and it's going to shut down your R&D program as soon as it starts. Or, worse yet, they'll wait until you get fairly far along and then when you've got something useful, then they can sue you and, and basically you'll have no one to sell it to but them because they've got this controlling IP, you're over a barrel. Yes? How about if you can't figure out what you need because you're doing something in software and what you incorporate is so obvious to you that it's like the one-click market basket checkout yeah. or the swipe, the finger swipe across the screen. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you research and investigate all the patents of the obvious? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a thicket. Um, so so there's, there's, there's this huge dichotomy, dichotomy between sort of life science, I'll throw chemistry, biology, medical all together, and computer engineering from software to, to mechanical engineering together. Um, on the life sciences side, you've got this huge literature. You've got all these academic centers who are actually doing a lot of the work. They publish, publish, publish to get their work done. And the government does a lot of research and they, and they publish. And you can search and you can find all sorts of information. And you know, the, a molecule is a molecule. You can search on the chemical structure and the chemical structures will be contained in patents and you'll be able to find it. And there are search services that are expert at doing that. And, and that's easy. You're absolutely right. In the, in the hardware and software areas, no one publishes. No, no one, certainly no one puts their code out there. Um, and uh, it, it makes it very difficult to find the prior art. It's one of the reasons why the soft, people on the software side are constantly complaining about a lot of junky patents issuing in software. And there was a lot of pressure on the courts and on Congress to do something about it. The courts came out with a decision, KSR. Um, where they basically sort of relaxed the requirement for patent examiners to find certain aspects of the prior art in printed publications and said, you know, you can use common sense and you can say, this, you know, the examiner can simply step in and say, I think this is obvious. Um, and I don't see that in, in the art, but I see this in the art and I see this in the art and this in the art and I could put those together and you could do that. And the court said that uh, the, the person of ordinary skill in the art is not an automaton. They have some general, you know, innovative sense and they can take logical steps to progress things. So um, you can't search it and you're at risk and it's very difficult. What you want to hope for is that whatever it is that you're using, you've got different modules that in the event something s s pops up that you can design around the patent and that's a term of art that we use. So, the patent claims this, you just go around it uh, by, by doing something different. And if you've got those options, you're in a much better position. That, yeah. Always modules. Yeah, if you, know, if you can. <laughs> um, so determine what you can afford. Um, you know, that, that's a, it's a big issue. Um, IP protection is expensive. You can't take every idea that you have and file a patent application on it in every jurisdiction in the world. I'll show you some numbers on cost in, in a little bit. And there are a lot of companies that wind up being, uh, they call them pat patent poor, 
um, the company has no money, but it's got patents. <laughs> and, and they can't afford to do research, but they've got all these applications pending. And now they're trying to basically sell a patent portfolio to the VCs or to some company, some potential acquirer, but they didn't, don't have the budget to actually do the experiments to get to their proof of concept. Um, and so we'll, we'll, we'll talk a bit about that and how to avoid it. And so decide what, what to protect based on what you can afford, what you need, and what you know you have, and decide what to avoid in terms of the, the, the patents owned by third parties that you're aware of. Um, and you've got you've to think about that early on because you don't want to start down a path where you're develop, doing your product development uh, in terms of what seems most efficient to you, only to find out that there's a block better to find out earlier that you need to avoid some third-party patent and go around it even if it is less efficient. And as academics, you know, there, there's a tendency to just want to do the most graceful, elegant solution to the problem. Sometimes you don't because of these landmines that are in the, uh, the patent landscape. Um, choosing the right type of IP protection uh, I'll just talk about two. I'm not going to talk about trademarks and copyrights here tonight. Let's just talk about trade secret and patents. Um, these are your two big options for inventions. Um, you can simply try to keep everything secret. And it's not enforceable. There's no enforcement mechanism. If someone gets your trade secret, however they might get it, right? They get your trade secret, it's no longer a secret, and that's the end of it. The, the trade secret is dead. It could be a former employee who goes blab, uh, someone, you know, leaves a notebook in the subway, whatever it might be. Um, uh, someone else independently develops it. You can't now come back and say, well, I developed it first. It was my trade secret. It's not enforceable in any sense. The only thing you can possibly do is sue a person who wrongfully disclosed the trade secret, which would generally be, you know, an employee who goes out and, and breaches their duty of confidentiality to the company. Maybe they get hired away by a, uh, another company. It, but it's not very satisfying. Odds are they don't have a lot of money. Odds are you take every penny that they have, it's not going to help your company very much because you've lost your trade secret. Yes, Alice? Um, I was just curious, are there certain types of um, IP that lends itself more to trade secrets than others? Like, I was told once that, like, manufacturing practices yeah. may be, e like, when it's something physical, it's yeah. easier to do that with than something conceptual. Um, things that are not sold. So just about anything that goes on the shelf can be reverse engineered, right? So if your trade secret, though, is your method of manufacturing so that you're getting, let's say you're making um, uh, discs, uh, chips, uh, circuit chips. And they're made on these silicon wafers, and they do you know 100 different or 100 or 500 chips on one disc. But there's a defect rate, and those defects are, are a pain. They cut the, the chips out, they test them, and they wind up discarding a fairly high percentage of them, and only keeping the ones that work. If you can knock down, if you've got something in your process that reduces that error rate, you can decrease your manufacturing costs very significantly, and have a big edge in the market. If you were um, uh, doing cell culture type stuff. Uh, there's lots of secret sauce in growing cells. Um, you know, things that just seem like magic and, and people can't even reproduce them in other laboratories. And so don't, <laughs> don't put it in your patent application unless you have to because you may give away the secret sauce and you'll never know if someone else is using it. Yes? Can you run into a problem if you use a trade secret and obviously you don't publish anything and someone else, what you said, if they come up with it at the same time, and they happen to patent it, that you're not only competing against them, but you're yeah. prevented from actually doing it. Yeah, so the, so the question is, if you're, if you're maintaining something as a trade secret, someone else comes up with it independently, and they patent it, are you out of luck? And the answer is, yeah, you're screwed. So you made your choice. You weren't going to seek patent protection. You weren't going to disclose it. So the, uh, the, a patent is a bargain with the public. All right? So the, the, the theory behind it is this. You have to file an application which discloses your invention and which teaches someone of ordinary skill in the art how to make and use your invention without undue experimentation and with a reasonable expectation of success. These are all the buzzwords you'll, you'll hear if you get, get involved with this. Um, so you've got to make that divulgation of information. And in exchange, you get your patent and you have the right to use it for 20 years from your date of filing, okay? That's the quid pro quo. 
You got your exclusivity, the government will give you a monopoly, but you've got to disclose it so that when your monopoly is over, now it's thoroughly in the public domain. And if you decide to go the trade secret route, you're not divulging it, you're not giving it to the public, and you're at risk of someone independently developing it and patenting it, and you have no recourse. All right. Um, so as I said, you know, all you can do is you basically sue someone who breaches a confidentiality agreement with you. It's hard, you, and you're not going to get the secret back. All you can do is get money damages from that person. Yeah. So, <coughs> so even if uh, somebody doesn't, <coughs> you can't recover from one of your employees, for example, but the uh, recipient of the confidential information would probably uh, be another company. Mm -hmm. uh, so what is the burden of proof that you have to show to the courts that the recipient knowingly or knowingly was a participant in this fraud? Yes, I mean, it would be exactly that. You would have to show that they were knowingly um, interfering with your contractual relations with their former employee. It would be tortious interference with contract. You could try to get damages there. Um, but, you know, the, the employers will all have when you get a new employee, they're going to have to sign an agreement with the company, and that agreement is going to say, I will not give to the company, my new company, any trade secrets of my former company. And they make you swear that you're never going to do that. So if it does happen, they hide behind that, and they say, like, we had no idea. We received it innocently. And if they received it innocently, secret's gone. You, don't, you can't get it back. So they're, yeah, but if they were, they purposefully, you know, got your employee and, you know, lured them away from your company and then, you know, pressured them to, to give them the secrets, you could go for a tortious interference claim against them. I think, that, I think that's about it. Um, so it's not going to be easy. It's, uh, it's like Slugsworth in, in Willy Wonka trying to get the kids to divulge the gobstopper. Um, okay, what, now why, why would you want to do a, a, a trade secret? Well, sometimes there, there are there are things, that, these secrets that aren't patentable. Um, it might be something that's, um, you know, a law of nature, a phenomenon of nature. It might be an algorithm which isn't per se patentable. Um, or it could be something where just enforcement is so impractical that, you know, you, you've got your patent describing it, but how in the world would you know if anyone's enforcing it? Or if it's the kind of thing that can be moved around the world so easily, all a competitor has to do is find a place to practice your invention where you don't have a patent. I'll give you a real example, and I, I advised a company to do this. There was some, a company that had a patent on a, uh, a method of um, producing an antibody to whatever it was, protein X, comprising administering uh, Im an immunogenic preparation of a certain epitope, right? And that's what their patent covered. They didn't have a patent on the antibodies. It was the method of generating antibody through immunization. So you had to do the immunization method. So we just told them, ship the rabbits to Australia. They don't have a patent in Australia. Shoot them up with the immunogen in Australia. When they've got a good reaction, ship the frozen spleens back here. You're not infringing. Okay? So, I mean, so it's easy, I mean, it, it, depending upon what, you know, and it, what you're doing and what you're, you're claiming, it's pretty easy to get around certain types of inventions. So a trade secret might just be your best way. Why publish the chemical structure of your immunogen, give away the epitope to everyone in the world so that they can use it any place where you don't have a patent? So, it, so getting a patent isn't necessarily a good idea because it forces you to divulge what would otherwise be a trade secret. And wait for Alice. So if you're working on a medical device and there are a few algorithms within software that you know, make your medical device work mm -hmm. and you want to get a patent on it, do you have to reveal those algorithms because that's the only way someone could reproduce your medical device? If it is reflected in the claimed invention. So, so what you, need to, what you need to do in a, in a patent specification, so the specification is the body of the patent, it's the part that looks like a scientific paper, okay? Um, scientific paper with really awkward legalese language. In there, you have to provide a written description of the invention and the best method known to you of making and using it, which would enable the person of ordinary skill in the art to make and use without undue, undue experimentation with a reasonable expectation of success. 
Okay? So the, the patent office will look at that, and if you're claiming some aspect and that can't be achieved without disclosing the algorithm, then the claim shouldn't issue. So now if it's not necessary, if there's something else that's patentable that you've done, then fine. But, but if it's necessary to make and use the invention, yeah, it's got to be in the patent application. So you can't hold those things back. There are, I'll give you another example though, like a time when I, I had a client pull back from something. They, um, it was a big biotech company that has a very large facility not far from here. And they had come up with a um, vector, which was really good for expressing proteins in a certain type of cell. In, and they wanted to get a patent on the vector. And then typically you'll do claims to the vector, to the vector with a heterologous gene in there, to a cell transformed with the vector and the heterologous gene, to a method of producing the protein encoded by the heterologous gene, blah, blah, blah. All the different ways you can look at the invention. The method of producing the protein would have been in a certain cell type. So their best mode, the best way they knew how to do it was in a certain cell type. They didn't want to disclose the cell type because they had found in bioreactors you've got problems with cells that mutate and they wind up sticking to the walls of the vat and they build up and they clog everything up and you'd like the cells to remain in solution and they actually finally got a cell line that didn't, whatever, it, they don't, had no idea what mutation it had, but it actually grew really well in the reactor. They didn't want to disclose it. So we pulled back the claims on methods of producing the protein because that would have implicated doing it in the cells. We'd have to disclose the cells. And we rely just on claims to the vector and stop there. So we can, you can define your invention sometimes in order to maintain some trade secrets. And it's just, it's, sometimes it'll work. It just depends a lot on your invention. Um, the other time when um, uh, trade secrets are, are really useful is when the value is really ephemeral. Um, another example, uh, life sciences, uh, someone d discovers the, uh, the, the leptin receptor and um, they publish on it and they file a patent application on the leptin receptor and they have claims to methods of identifying inhibitors so that you could have this wonderful weight loss drug. Uh, but a patent typically takes you know, biotech five, seven, eight years often before it issues. And it's published 18 months after you file it. Plus, they published it in the scientific literature as well, so it was out there, right? The patent was pointless because everyone, you know, all the big drug companies were going through their small molecule libraries, screening them against the receptor, and they were gonna be done way less than five or seven or eight years. By the time the patent had issued, Everyone had done as much research as, you know, as they could or wanted to on it, and you'd have a patent to stop people from doing something they already did, and that's too late. It's too late to do that. So, uh, so, so there's a place for trade secrets. Um, okay, patents. Now, what do patents do that's, that's quite different? A patent actually confers the right to exclude others from practicing, more jargon, practicing the invention, making, using, selling, offering for sale, or importing is practicing the invention, right? Um, so you can exclude others. If someone else is doing what you have claimed and you've got an issued patent claim to, you can go to court, you have a trial, and if you win, they, fi they find that they are doing what you have claimed and you have a patent to, an order will issue, it's telling them to stop doing it. You can get monetary damages if, if you suffered any damages for, for them doing it. Um, or you could license it to them for royalty, let them keep doing it, but you're gonna make some money off the top. Um, what a patent doesn't do, and this is rather counterintuitive, is it doesn't give you the right to practice your own invention. So I have a patent on a method of doing X with steps A, B, and C, and that doesn't mean that you can do X with steps A, B, and C, because someone might have patented already a method of doing X, including step A, and you infringe that because you do step A. You also do steps B and C, but that doesn't matter. Their step A patent covers what you're doing, right? Or it's a cell culture medium and you found this gamish of compounds that makes your embryonic stem cells thrive. Um, and you want to do that, but it turns out that one of the compounds that you're putting in there is patented. Someone's got a patent on one of the growth factors. The fact that you have a patent on your overall cell culture medium does you no good. You need a license under their patent for that 
components of the overall thing. So there's no, doesn't give you a freedom to operate, doesn't mean that you're free to do what you've patented. It means you can exclude others from doing it. Okay. Yes. I just had a quick question about the applications. Mm -hmm. Patent application has no like enforcement power. No. No. Um, there's some provisional royalty, provi you know, rights if if you provide um, a third party with notice of your claims and your claims issue substantially identical to what was published, you may be able to sue them for damages for a reasonable royalty on the intervening period. Um, I don't think I've ever seen it happen. Um, it's just, and because I, I, I haven't seen the case law yet as to what substantially identical means. It's one of those words like reasonable doubt that, you know, it takes years and years and years of cases for people to get a sense of what it means. And it's fairly new doctrine. Um, so why file patent applications, okay? <laughs> and, and I'm a patent attorney and this is my business and I wish you would all file lots of patent applications through my firm, but I gotta, I gotta say, you know, why? Um, <laughs> so there are substantial disadvantages, okay? Your, your publication of your patent application at 18 months is gonna disclose your trade secrets. There's no guarantee you'll ever get the patent. So it's guaranteed your trade secrets are gonna be published, but there's no guarantee a patent will ever issue. Um, and even if a, d a patent does issue, it's years down the road, all right? Um, so it could be, you know, again, five to 10 years away that your trade secrets have been out there. Are you better off just keeping it secret and getting to market first? And being to market first is a big, big advantage. Um, more disadvantages, cost. So these are guesstimates, depends on, on you know, what the invention is. But you know, maybe $15,000 to $40,000 to draft and file your initial application. Um, and that's if you want it to be real complete. You can do these, we'll talk about provisionals a little bit later. People do these quick and dirty provisionals that are real cheap. I'm not a fan. Um, but if you want to do a, you know, a, a real good job on a complicated thing, there's your initial cost. Then, 12 months later, you're probably going to want protection outside the United States. So you'll file a PCT, that's the Patent Cooperation Treaty, a PCT application. Um, that will basically give you access to, to protection all around the world. Almost every, all the major industrialized nations are, are members of the PCT, and increasingly even, you know, Turks and Caicos joined. I mean, so it's, it's almost the planet at this point. Um, then, at the 30-month date, so 30 months from filing your first case. So, so you file, 12 months later, you do a PCT. At the 30-month date, some countries, 31 first month date, you have to nationalize your PCT application in the countries where you really want protection. Costs skyrocket, okay? The 25 grand assumes you're going real cheap. You're gonna take like English-speaking countries like the US, Canada, and Australia, so they don't have to do translations. You're certainly going to want Europe, though. Probably going to pay six, seven thousand dollars there. Um, if you want Japan, depends on how long it is. There's you know page limits and, and, and your translation fees, and then it gets weird. Um, you know, for some reason, a translation into Finnish is ten times the cost of a translation into Swedish. Um, so you'll you'll find you know you can easily spend two hundred and fifty thousand dollars trying to cover the big country, whatever countries are relevant for you, and the big countries, certainly, and that number can go way, way higher. I have a client that's tried to hit every place on the planet that, you know, they could find, and they spent well over, you know, one, one and a half million dollars nationalizing an application. So, so that cost hits, and then, then, in each of those countries, the patent offices pick up the application and they start examining it. And you now have to pay lawyers in each of those countries to fight with each of those patent offices, all right? So let's say you, you have a U.S. attorney who drafted the case and is in charge of it, you know, I would correspond with those people and I would give them instructions, but every one of them is going to be sending a bill every time they have to do something. So, you know, $5,000 annual costs, really low end. That's assuming you're just doing like the U.S., right? Um, 50 grand if you were doing the major countries and it could get much higher if you did every place, yeah. Uh, thank you. Does PCT give you any kind of protection for software or algorithms in China, practically speaking? Um, so, well, so first response is PCT gives you no protection at all. 
Um, a patent does not issue from a PCT application. It is sort of a, uh, a pre-application, it's a holding place application before you nationalize into the different countries. There will be an examination of the PCT application by PCT examiners. Um, they're, you know, they're, we have them in the US, they're in Munich, they're in The Hague, they're in various receiving offices for, for and uh, Korea has a very good examining office for, for software. Um, and can you nationalize software into China? As far as I know, yes. But a lot of us in the field, China has a wonderful constitution. On paper, it looks better than ours. Um, but I wouldn't trust my civil rights over there so much. Their patent laws are wonderful, too. Um, if you read their, you know, their patent laws, you would think there's no piracy whatsoever of American IP coming out of China. But so it's, it's the enforcement that's the issue. And, and again, you know, how do you know? How do you know if someone's infringing your patent in, in Guangdong? I mean, it's, you, know, it's, you have no idea what's happening unless you see products being shipped into the U.S. and you can stop them you know, as, they're, as they're arriving at port in San Diego. I mean, you might be able to do that, but generally you're, you're going to be ignorant about what's going on and then that's the first step to enforcement is identifying the infringement. So that's tough. Um, and of course, it's time consulting for the, the R&D people and the principals of the company to be do, dealing with IP issues all the time and the lawyer is always calling and dragging the people away from the bench so that they can work on responses to patent offices. So that's, that's a cost. Else we have a uh, question in the back. I speak loud. Oh, no. <laughs> <Mike>. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Thanks. Um, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so the, the lowest cost that you have listed there, annual cost for prosecuting U.S. applications, um, I was curious what, what that implies, um, because I've, I've heard that um, costs, typical costs for enforcing a patent can be really, really expensive, like mm -hmm. in the millions. Yep, this is not um, enforcement. This is prosecution. Okay. So Could you is, nuance the difference there? Yeah, so, this is, so prosecution is the process of um, arguing with a patent office. And, and trying to convince the patent office that what you've done is entitled to a patent. In the United States, the requirements are that the claimed invention be new or novel, hasn't been done before, useful, um, some sort of industrial applicability, uh, that it be non-obvious, that's the tricky one in, in, in health sciences, so a person of ordinary skill in the art would not have found it obvious in light of all of the prior art, and the, and the person of ordinary skill in the art is not very ordinary, they are presumed to know everything. <laughs> they are presumed to know everything that was ever published anywhere in any language. Okay, so that's all prior art and the person of ordinary skill has access to all of that so they're presumed to know it. And then you've got your, your written description requirement of the application as well that the, the application has to describe the invention as I've said ten times now in order to allow one of skill in the art to make and use blah blah blah. Um, so, so that's the cost of arguing there. The five grand would be if you had a new small molecule, you write down the chemical structure, that's all you're claiming, and they can't find it anywhere in a database, they give you a patent, and it's real quick. If you want to claim a class of molecules with a bunch of R groups and variations and stuff, it could be a lot more expensive because they're going to be searching a lot more. They, your claims might start to encompass the prior art, um, so you're claiming something that's already out there and been, it's been done already. Then you get into a process of amending your claims, narrowing them to avoid the prior art and to figure out what truly is new <coughs> that, that you've done. So um, the 5K is if you do a really narrow claim to something that's really, truly novel. Um, here's the enforcement costs, okay? So this is patent litigation. Um, and it's extremely high. So these numbers are from the American Intellectual Property Law Association's 2013 economic report. They did surveys of, of patent firms across the country, and these are median numbers. So with less than $1 million at risk, it can cost you, the median is $700,000 to enforce the patent, which isn't a very good return, okay? Now, what often happens is when the, the at-risk number is the damages that you're asking for, so someone might have infringed your patent, sold 100,000 units of something, you're claiming um, you know, less than a million dollars of damage on that. But if you win, you get an injunction, a court order that tells them they have to stop doing it. So then you've got the next 19 years of your patent without any infringement. So 
what's at risk there is, is a little bit you know, understated because the value of an injunction can be really, really high because it gives you that monopoly. It clears the competitors out of your path. But as you can see, you know, you know, $5.5 million median um, for costs for you know, $25 million at risk. Uh, a startup company can't afford to do that. Now, that's, it's fine if you've already sold yourself, there's been an M&A and you've been acquired by you know, Genentech or Baxter or, or whatever, um, and, and they'll do it. And maybe, maybe when someone's infringing your patent, you, you go to them and that's part of your sales pitch for selling the company, that you know, you've got a damages case against your arch competitor here, buy us. Um, and then we've got the things we've talked about before where infringement could be undetectable, because it's secret. Um, or it's just outside your geographic range, it's in some country where you don't have a patent. All right, so more disadvantages. Now somewhere there's got to be a reason to get patents. Okay, good. Um, all right, so why? You know, wh wh why do you want them? Because it's really the only way you can product, uh, protect a product from direct copying. You can exclude others from the market. You have your monopoly rights that'll last for 20 years. That's your opportunity to earn back your R&D um, the Pharma uh, Association, Pharmaceutical Manufacturers Association now, their estimates of the average cost of getting a, a drug through phase three trials and approved is now up to a billion dollars. So a billion dollars in R&D. Now that's actually not the cost of any one drug. What they're including in there is the you know, 99 out of 100 that fail early on and all the money that was wasted on the failures, you gotta, they have to recoup that. But that your patent period is where you're gonna re recoup that investment. Um, so it allows you to exclude people. Um, you can also, you know, you patent, you, you, your invention may be able to be practiced in, you know, 20 different ways. There's, there's some variation about the theme and you're going to commercialize what you see as the absolute best way of doing it. But you may get a scope of patent claim that's broader than that. You may get to cover sort of the general idea of what you've done. And that can actually give you a broader avenue and really keep people at bay and give you a much broader niche. So it's not just a matter of stopping someone from selling exactly your product. You may be able to carve out a space um, in the market. And we'll talk about sort of choke point claims uh, in a bit. Um, licensing potential. So they can be, a, patents can be a great revenue source. Um, you may come up with something that is useful in one context and you intend to apply it in that one context but it has utility in a bunch of others. So perhaps the person who came up with Velcro intended to use it you know, on sneakers and then it turns out like, oh well there's the backpack market and there's you know, the um, you know, ski bags and then all these other different things that you can use it for you're only going to manufacture and sell the one product, but you can license those rights to other people to use it in other contexts. Or you develop an antibody that you intend to use as a diagnostic, but you license the rights to it to another party that's going to develop it uh, for um, therapeutic purposes. And as a startup, you'd be wise to probably start with diagnostics and not go to, th to therapeutics first. Um, so there's a, a, a real use of them. You can't really license a trade secret very easily. Um, so the, the patents for a startup company are often the, one of the key things that the investors are, are, are banking on. They know that even if the, you know, the company goes under, well, at least there's some kind of asset that they could sell at some point in a bankruptcy sale. Uh, if the key personnel leave, it's nice to know that there's IP that's going to stay. So it's, it's all well and good that you know, you're investing in part in the founders and their geniuses and they've got this great vision and, and you know, you're going to sell the VCs on, on the founders' vision. But they'd also like to see the IP. So your IP becomes a real marketing tool and, and, and a money raising tool to convince people that there's something here that's going to stay, there's something worth investing in. It also gets you past sort of the, you know, the sniff test that the patent office looked at this and the patent office thought it was good enough, new enough, non-obvious for a patent. That's something, right? So it, it, it gives them a little bit more security that they're not just being, you know, romanced by the, by the startup in, into investing in something that's, that's a pipe dream or that may not work or is very obvious. Um, 
litigation isn't always necessary. Um, so having your patents uh, can be a real deterrent. And rule number one for a startup should be don't get sued. Because that, those numbers that I put up for the, the litigation costs, that's not just being the plaintiff, that's being the defendant. And if you're the defendant and you get sued, they could just put you out of business, all right? Even if you're, you don't infringe, all right? So I, I have a client that was a startup of about 15 people. They had about, at their best, $2 million a year in revenue. They got sued by a $150 million market capitalization French firm. And their intent was to drive them out of business with the litigation. It was complete BS. They didn't infringe the claims, and we thought they were invalid to boot. And, but they just really didn't have the money to, to fight the litigation. Now, they wound up fighting it, um, and you know, we basically fronted them the money to do so. And they won, and we invalidated the claims and all that, but it, was, it just put this huge cloud over the company, and, and, and it's cost them dearly. Uh, but if you've got your own patents, there's a real deterrent effect. People will try to avoid that litigation scenario. They will design around you. Um, they'll stay out of your market space and, and leave you alone to avoid it. Um, even pending applications. You know, if you've got a risk-averse competitor, you, know, you don't even have the patent yet, but you file an application claiming that I think I own this. Do they want to now put $50 million into a research program to develop something which you may have a patent on in three or five years? That's, that's, it really increases their, their downside risk. Um, and that can be bargaining chips too. So if you've got a, if you've got a good patent estate, your competitor's got a good patent estate, you could both you know, do mutually assured destruction by suing each other, um, but odds are instead you'll reach some sort of compromise. If you don't have any patents and they do, it's mutually it's, it's assured that you'll be destroyed in, instead. So uh, it's, it's a good defense to have. Um, and sometimes companies will purposefully patent things that they don't intend to use. Um, you know, you have your R&D people looking at the competitors' products and patents and saying, God, they're stupid, why don't they do this? They could improve their product by changing this this way. Well, you can file a patent application on that and cover that and prevent them from improving their, pat their, their product. And you can really, or use it as a bargaining chip again. Okay, so what should you do to implement uh, an IP strategy? Uh, at your startup. One is learn a little patent law. Um, you know, I know the saying, a little learning is a dangerous thing. It's okay. You're, if you're going to be an entrepreneur, you should be ready for a little danger. Um, so try and, try and get conversant with it. Get conversant with, with the, the concepts and the subjects. Everyone at the company is, has got to understand it at some level. Certainly a bunch of the management people, the R&D heads, and you've got to sort of inculcate this knowledge throughout the company. Um, you really want to be on the alert for finding inventions when they're made. You want to be on the alert for you know, blowing rights uh, through disclosures. Um, being helpful to the patent attorney because if you know, we can't, we, we're not in your lab, we don't know what you're doing, we don't see all the prototypes, we don't know the things that you tried that failed necessarily. You've got to be able to spot the things that are key that will help us draft the, the applications well to cover what's important and, and to, to, to really ex help explain to us what's, what's going to be important here. Um, and just knowing a little patent law will help you know when to talk to the attorney. Um, and really if you ask uh, a, a patent attorney to give a free tutorial to like your whole company, um, they'll show up. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's actually to our advantage. We would much rather be working with a company of people who know what they're doing than deal with trying to clean up mistakes afterwards. It, it's very frustrating. So um, I think 90 out of 100 attorneys in Boston would be happy to you know, come to your company and, and give a tutorial. Um, know the prior, yes? Um, along with that, do you think there's any advantage to taking the patent bar if you have the time and money to take the class? Or even if you don't plan on ever like becoming a patent attorney yourself, just to have that knowledge? Boy, I wouldn't. Uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a drag. Uh, and and it's, um, it's a lot of just horrific detail. Um, so it's, it's rules, rules, rules. and, and, and you know, you basically have to, you know, memorize, you know, 35 U.S. code and 37 CFR, and it's just all these regulations. That you need conceptual stuff 
here. Um, and the, the patent bar is actually the only federally administered bar uh, exam. And um, uh, it's, um, I think right now, like they're giving out registration numbers to like in like the 70,000s. So there really just haven't been that many um, people doing it. So it's a, it's a small group. Um, but I, I just wouldn't recommend that. It's just, um, so uh, know the prior art. Teach yourself how to um, do some of these things, how to find out about. So what's the prior art? So prior art is um, everything that has been published and is publicly available, is publicly known, publicly used um, prior to the date you file your application or your priority date, everything. So a dissertation in Hungarian in a university library, one copy in Budapest, it's part of the prior art, all right? Um, you're supposed to know it. Um, you know, so it is so much easier now that we've got databases, but 20 years ago it was really hellish. People would uh, go down to the patent office and search paper copies of, of patents. Um, there's lots of free stuff out there. The USPTO has a free database, which is awkward um, um, to use. It's really not great, but it's there and it's free. Um, WIPO's patent scope, I think, is a little bit better. WIPO is the World Intellectual Property Organization. Uh, they run the PCT. Um, uh, EPO, the European Patent Office, uh, has eSpaceNet and the Patent Register, which are actually quite good. Uh, for, for, you know, medical literature, health science li literature, I'm sure you all know PubMed um, and databases like that. Um, and there are commercial databases, you know, if you've got the money to spend, I don't know if you will, but you know, you can, you can subscribe to things like Thompson Innovation has a great search engine, uh, Micropat, and I think is that sort of a front end for Thompson's platform as well. Um, and you can set up searches which will automatically run on a regular basis and update so that you could track competitors' patents and patent applications, or you can have keyword things where it will just, you know, send you every now and then the latest stuff that's published, which is really kind of helpful. Uh, how do you feel about using Google Patents for these searches? I use it every day. You know, um, it's, it's convenient. It's the fastest thing on my, you know, it's the fastest thing on my desktop to get to. I can log into these other ones and they keep timing me out. Um, so it's just, I use it all the time. When I'm doing a real search though, for a client, I use the commercial databases because they'll, they can hit everything, you know. So they'll hit the Japanese databases and the, you know, Canadian database and Australia. So, you know, Google Patents is a good quick and dirty way of doing things. Frankly, anything that's important is going to get a PCT application filed. So even if you limited your searches to PCT applications, you're going to get 99% of stuff. But you know, for our for a legal practice, 99% is not good enough. So we'll do the commercial databases. Um, LexisNexis Total Patent, um, I think, is a total mess, but it's there. Yeah, um, you you can use it. I, I really don't like it at all. Um, okay, then. Teach your attorney. <laughs> um, so some people go around thinking they, inter they interview patent attorneys and think I'm trying to find someone who is an expert in FCRN antibodies and they're used in regulating, you know, immune, you know, complement mediated immune re reactions. You're not going to find that. <laughs> All right, you're not going to find a patent attorney who knows exactly what you're doing. If they did know exactly what you're doing. They're probably representing your competitor and then they can't represent you anyway, right? And so, so you're going to have to teach your attorney. Um, a good one, you can treat like a first year grad student, you know, in your lab and, you know, give them some review articles, um, bring them up to speed, spend some face time, much more efficient than sending people stacks of papers. Uh, I have some clients who inv invite me to their lab meetings, you know, and I'm, I'm happy to go and not charge for the time. Again, in the end, it helps me because I know what's going on in the company, and it, after the lab meeting, you know, I might walk up to someone and say, what were you talking about? I, I, we ne I never heard about this project before. And then we find out that there's been some project going on that actually they've solved some problem and, and nobody thought to write up an invention disclosure. You know, and, 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 and so you become aware of things. So teach the attorney, we're, we're educable. Um, let's see, so pat patent claims that cover that the claim encompasses the prior art or the prior art falls inside the description of the claims are not allowable. So you really have to identify that. You've you got to know the prior art so you don't waste your time trying to claim things that you're not entitled to. Um, that's very important. And it's important for obviousness reasons. It's important for what we'll call teach aways. Again, it's a little term of art. If the prior art all says, 
you got to do it this way. And you've, this is a real problem. You can't use this for this reason. And you find out that it's wrong, that you can. So that prior art, it doesn't anticipate your invention. It doesn't fall within the scope of your claims. But it's really relevant. That's great ammunition for us. We go to the patent office and we say, look, examiner, all the art was pointing this way. Our guys went that way. This is non-obvious. They're entitled to a patent. So, so you've got to be aware of that. Um, Looking at your competitors' patent applications is great for lots of reasons. One, avoid infringing their patents. You don't want to get in a lawsuit. But two, look at the kind of claims they're getting. Look at the kind of things that they're regarding as inventions. You will probably be surprised at how small they are. I remember doing a, a, something for a medical device company where it was basically sort of a spectrophotometer for looking at some uh, blood samples and it was feeding in a series of tubes that were in a rack. The invention was that the tubes were not circular in cross-section, they were squared so that the light didn't bend. And <laughs> I was just like, damn, why didn't anyone think of that before? But no one had. <laughs> and and they, so they were getting much better readings using these things, plus the beauty of it was they could then sell these square vials to the hospitals which would then dispose of them, and the disposables were the actual big driver of revenue, not the machine that they sold in the first place. Um, so you, you'll be surprised at the little things that, that are, are, are patentable. And what I'll often tell people is, tell me about what you did that didn't work. Because if you were working on something and you couldn't get it to work and couldn't get it to work and couldn't get it to work and finally figured out how to do it, that's probably an invention. I'm assuming that you're one of skill in the art, right? That you're, <laughs> you're, you're, you're not a dope. So if you didn't figure it out without doing a bunch of errors, that suggests to me it's non-obvious. And there's a lot of focus, too much focus by people on, I want to achieve this end goal here. But to get to that end goal, I've got to go through 25 steps. And if you've got five hurdles between the beginning and the end goal, you might have five patents there. And any one of them could be valuable. Any one of them could stop your competitor from getting to the same goal. So any Anything that, that, that really was a problem for you, you should tell your attorney about because that's, that's a, something for us to focus on. Um, let's see. Uh, competitors' patents will often have a lot of information that's disclosed. Uh, you can learn their trade secrets because they're publishing all their trade secrets. They may not get the patent because the examiner doesn't think it's worthy or because they decide not to spend any more money on it. So you can actually get a lot of free information from that. Um, and stuff where they're not publishing. They may not be, they wouldn't publish this stuff in a, in, a, in a scientific journal, but they're dumping it into their patent application. So read, start reading the, the patent literature. You can see uh, where the competition is going. They'll, you know, th that'll tell you, oh, they're filing patents over here. That must mean the company is going to follow this path in their research. That's an opening for us. Let's go this way. All right, so you can try and avoid collisions with, with the competition. Um, and I'd suggest if you can, you know, maintain a, an, an updated library of patents um, and have, lots of, have them accessible to people in the company. Yeah. Uh, so you had mentioned sometimes companies will file patents with no intention of ever using it. Yeah. So if, you, if they were to do that and you look at their patterns and assume that they're going in a certain direction, do people do, like, try to mislead their competition with so, patents? So, it so seems like a really expensive way yeah, to do it. It's not, it's, not that they, it's not that they file patents in order to... Um, uh, with no intention of, misuse, of, of using them, is that they'll file a, a patent application and then they may wind up abandoning it because it doesn't pan out. The, so you're filing early on in, in the R&D process. You get a, you know, look good in, in vitro. You put it in a mouse. It looked lousy. They drop it. Um, but there's still information in there that you could pick up. Maybe you can make it work where they couldn't make it work. Um, there are things called defensive publications. Um, IBM was sort of the, the, the leader in that. They actually created their own like magazine called the IBM technical bulletin or something like that. And whenever they had invention disclosures, they couldn't possibly file patents on all the things their engineers were coming up with. They didn't want anyone else to get patents on them. So they published them in this like self-published bulletin just to get them out there, create prior art, so that no one else would get a patent on it. Um, and you can do defensive publications, but you know, patent applications are a very expensive way of, of doing a defensive publication. Yes? <coughs> um, I've heard some advice. Um, from some people that um, to not search competitors' patents, like mm -hmm. uh, unless you really have to, because 
that you might you know be knowingly infringing later on and and that you'll you'll be subject to you know treble damages do you have any what's your philosophy about that uh, so it's like not looking at the, the the road signs so that you didn't know I was speeding you know <laughs> I'd, I'd rather know I mean it's, you know, it's so yeah and there is there is an issue so you have a duty to disclose to the patent office you have a duty to disclose all the material information that you are aware of. In fact, everybody involved in, in prosecution of the patent is, has that duty to disclose. So I have that duty on any case that I'm working on. So if you show me a piece of prior art and I think it's material, I have to send it to the patent office whether you want me to or not. And if you are aware of something and do lots of searching, you'll become aware of more stuff. But to me, all that's going to do is, you know, if that, if, if that prior art is going to render the patent invalid, it's going to keep you from wasting your money pursuing an ultimately invalid patent. You can refocus elsewhere. You can design around you know, and, and come up with something better. Um, is an invalid patent of value? Yeah, it is. <laughs> you know, there'll be people who won't know that it's invalid or they won't be sure that it's invalid and they'll design around it. And, you know, so maybe you can keep your head in the sand and, and get your claims allowed. And even though they're ultimately invalid, if it ever went to court, it may not go to court because it has deterrent effect and because juries have no idea what's going on with, with, with high-tech stuff. Um, you know, we, uh, we had a trial uh, last year on a rationally designed meganucleases. They're, they're proteins which cut DNA with a recognition sites of 18 to 22 base pairs. That's huge. So they'll cut a genome in a single spot. And um, we did a focus group uh, before the trial, a couple of weeks before the trial. We had a jury consultant come in. They got people from Delaware and they arranged three jury pools and we did a presentation, sort of a mock trial in front of them. And they were videotaped during their, de their deliberations and nobody had any idea what was going on. It was fascinating. Um, and each, in, in each case, there was one person in the room who was louder than the others and basically bullied everybody else into going away with their opinion. And it, it was fascinating just watching the dynamics of these mock juries. Um, and it was frightening. <laughs> you know, it was really, so I mean, so trials are, you know, very um, unpredictable things. Um, and a lot of companies will avoid it. So you could have an invalid patent and you could win at trial. And so they do have value. If, if you've got the money to gamble on it, if you want to spend all the money on, on a lawsuit. So, um, okay, let's see. Next, okay. Um, so patent strategies wind up being very, very specific to the, the situations that can be company specific, really looking at your technology, what you want to do. Are you going to be a fee-for-service provider? <clears throat> you know, are people going to uh, send you tissue sam samples from tumors and you're going to look for particular oncogenes and do your bioinformatics analysis on it and then send them back you know, some sort of report on the tissue? Is, is, is that your business? Or are you actually going to make something that's going to be sold but in the Sigma catalog? You know, you're going to come up with a new plasmid and, and Life Technologies will sell it. Um, so y your, your strategy has got to think about how you're going to sell it, um, who you're going to market to, who will the infringers be, um, and how would you identify them. So you, you tailor your, your um, patent strategy that way. Stage of development matters um, to some extent too. I mean, obviously, I, you know, for, for Merck, you know, we do anything that you know, is necessary to you know, get a case if they're interested in it. For a startup, we've got to figure out how much can we spend, what can we do, what's the budget, what, what has to be left on the floor. Um, industry specific, very different between the, the, the things that I have uh, listed here. Um, and then there's the, the, the choke point idea. Um, so by choke points, I think I've sort of explained it now. One of my um, colleagues thinks, well, th there's, there's, there's choke point approach, right? So I've got this long process to get to the product, or I've got a product that has 55 components, all right? And rather than trying to patent all of that, if I found out that what was really critical about my cell culture medium is that I've got a nicotinamide precursor at a concentration below a certain threshold, um, and or in my um, uh, engineering of a protein, I just find out that there's a certain residue which if I change it, stabilizes the structure enormously, gives me much greater activity, or in a medical device, 
uh, you know, an insulin delivery pump, I discover a certain type of uh, polymeric membrane which allows the, the, you know, the flow to be better, right? Some sort of antiphoretic membrane. Maybe, maybe you just focus on that. You don't have to, to try and patent the entire device in, in all of its different aspects. If there's one major hurdle, if there's one aha moment, one problem, major problem that you had to solve, and it was the solution to that problem that is really what's letting you get to the product or the pro service, and everything else is re relatively routine, focus on that choke point. Because if no one can do that, then they can't make something as good. The other approach is, you know, if you don't know, there's the, sh the shotgun approach. You know, and people go out there and they just file applications on every idea that comes into their head. And it's really expensive, but you'll wind up with, you know, some coverage and what turns out to be important, you know, will hopefully be covered, but it's a lot more expensive to, to do that approach. Um, so for startups, I, I very much recommend the choke point or bridges and tunnels, you can view it that way, you know, you can't cover the entire landscape, but if you can cover the bridges and the tunnels that, that give access to it, then, then you've got uh, good protection. Hello. Hi. So um, I think it's a very interesting point that, you know, this kind of patent application actually is sometimes applied to the academy field as well. Um, so my question is, what's the difference um, between the patent application, if, you know, from a um, academy um, field, for example, a university professor, or something like that, and compared to a, um, a company-based patent application? And the second question is, um, is there also sometimes a collaboration between industry and academy mm -hmm. and the co-file applications in, 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 some, in, you know, in some sort of like that? And what's the difference you know, there? Thank you. Yeah, so, um, so, so there's no reason that a patent application written by an academic or, or on behalf of an academic inventor should be written differently than one on behalf of a company. But there are residual effects of their, of their different jobs. Um, academics tend to be looking more at um, you know, proof of principle, um, trying to get at underlying mechanisms of action. We see lots of stuff coming out of the universities in, in the health sciences that are, that are directed to that. It's basic research, and that's their interest. And the lab doesn't want to take it to market. So they stop way short of getting to something that, that's applicable. Um, and so you'll see differences in the disclosures there. Um, companies are much more uh, loath to, to publish. They don't want to give away any of their trade secrets if, if they can avoid it. So you will see um, sometimes more bare-boned applications coming out of companies. They're going to put in only what is necessary to enable the invention. Um, and one of, the, one of the, the, the problems I see, with, which is really just bad lawyering, is I do see um, a lot of uh, patent attorneys will take a draft manuscript from an academic and they'll just turn it into a patent application, you know, with a, a day or two of work, something like that. And um, it actually winds up being uh, a very bad job because in an academic paper, think about it, like you've got the, the, the introduction to your paper is talking about what, everything that came before, and you're trying to convince your readership, fellow scientists, that what you're doing follows in the footsteps of what's been done before. It's consistent and consonant with what's been done before. It's, it, it, you should believe what I'm saying because it flows from what came before. And that is an explanation as to why it's obvious, right? <laughs> so if a patent examiner looks at that, they're gonna say, there you go. You've now explained why I should reject your application. So uh, it's not a good, approach to take a, an academic paper, put some claims on the back and file it with the patent office. Um, so uh, those, there are those differences. Collaborations between industry and academia, huge. Um, there was a period where they weren't. Some of you may have heard of the Bayh-Dole Act. So prior to the Bayh-Dole Act, which was probably around 1980 or 84 or so, um, if the federal government gave any funding to support an invention, then anything that came out of that had to be freely licensable to anybody who wanted it because it was taxpayers' money, and taxpayers' money went to support the invention, so you can't have any exclusive licenses. The result was that academic uh, collaborations were just poison. Uh, Big Pharma didn't want to work with 
um, any, any academics because you, a drug comes out of that. It's a generic. It's a generic from day one because you have to license it freely to everybody. So the Bayh-Dole Act came in to say, no, we're actually going to let the universities take sole ownership. We'll, the government will let, will let them have it. The government will step out of the way. And they put some mild requirements on it, preferences for U.S. industry and stuff like that, but, um, but did allow them to start doing exclusive licenses. And that led to the real boom um, of academic industry collaboration. Um, MIT's TLO um, really led the way, did a f spectacular job. Uh, Harvard, I'm embarrassed to say, uh, here in particular, um, it was a little bit aloof uh, early on and, and didn't really ramp up it, its, uh, its program a, as quickly. There was uh, sort of this taint that um, patents were for the techni technical institute down the river and not for the, um, the real purists um, researchers at, at, at Harvard. But now Harvard's uh, TLO is great uh, and the Harvard affili affiliated medical schools um, are filing loads of patents and um, are a real, real big player um, in, in, in the field. Um, let's see. So, what should you do with your yes? Sorry, a, fo a follow-on question to that statement. So, I'm, I'm at Harvard Medical School, and mm -hmm. obviously, we're funded a lot by NIH and DoD, yeah. et cetera. So, there is still some language in the funding mechanism which says government does get some rights to yes. patents. Is that something to worry about uh, at all these nope. days? Or yeah. so they're called the march in rights, um, and, and what it basically says is that, so theoretically. It's more than theory, it, it happens. So let's say um, sharing plow develops a series of compounds that might be used to treat a disease. Um, they've got 15 or 20 lead compounds. They pick the one that looks like the best to them. And they're going to take that through clinical trials. They can't afford to take all 15 through. It wouldn't make any sense to keep, take all 15 through. Um, they're going to take one. They're gonna, hopefully it gets to market. The other 14 will never be investigated because they've got rights to keep everybody else out, and they're not going to develop a drug to compete with their existing drug. So you wind up with IP sometimes locking up things, right? And then if they saw a third party developing something else that might be competition, well, they might want to buy that too and lock it up and keep it from coming in and competing with their drug. So there was a fear that we'd have these government-funded research could suddenly be locked up, and rather than being brought to market to benefit the public, it could be locked up. So they put in something called the march in rights, where the government would be able, if, if you were not commercializing the invention, then the government could step in and either force you to license it or just take it and, and start licensing it to others. It has never, ever, ever been exercised. The closest case came, um, I'm forgetting the name of the company, but it was, a, it was a method of isolating T cells for bone, uh, for bone marrow um, transplantation and purifying them and, 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 and saving them. And the company that had the exclusive rights just wasn't able to do it very well. And there was another company that was actually doing it and it was working. And, and then the, the patent hadn't issued yet. And when the patent issued, they wanted to stop the company that was being successful and was treating people and <laughs> you know, so, so that they could have the exclusive rights when they couldn't get it done. And um, that came close, and there was a lot of pressure, but they still didn't exercise the margin rights. But they, the, uh, the, the company that was, had the rights uh, was under enough pressure that they wound up licensing it. It may have actually been a compulsory license, but I'm not, I'm not certain. Yeah. Uh, some people invent something, patent it, then they start a company, and then assign the patent to the company. So yes. why do they do this? Um, because you're never going to get anyone to invest in the company otherwise. So when I'm investing in a company, I'm investing in a legal entity, and that legal en entity is going to get my money, and that legal entity better have some assets. <clears throat> and so for the founders to say, you know, well, I'm going to keep it. <laughs> Don't worry, I'll let the company use it is, is not going to be adequate. Um, I, I can't even think of many situations where I've seen the founders license something to the, to the company. So it's usually an assignment. So those are your core assets. That's what will attract the investors. Um, and, you know, someone else from, from my firm could talk about issues with founders and how they get diluted out over time um, in companies, but um, that's, that, that's standard. And, and anything you invent as an employee of the company, anything that you do within the scope of your employment is going to get, be assigned to the company. 
So now if you're the night watchman and you invent something, you know, looking at some lab notebooks, that'll be yours. But um, if you're a scientist at the company working there and that's your job is to do research and invent stuff, the company's going to own it, not you. Um, let's see. Um, so I'll skip that. Um, yeah. About assigning the patents by the founder to the company. Mm -hmm. Instead of assigning, uh, could we uh, could the founder license it for like a dollar a year, and you know, so, so in case of let's say bankruptcy mm -hmm. on, or any uh, other enforcement, the, the patents go back to the founder. Um, you can try and do that, and I think the VCs won't go along with it. Um, because if the company goes bankrupt, they want their money back. So they don't want it to go back to you. And you know, you'd have to do things where if you died, it wouldn't go to your you know, heirs, it would go to the company. I mean, it, it, would, be, you know, it would be a bit of a mess. It's not, it's, there's nothing illegal about it, but I, I have never seen it. I've never seen it in 20 years. It's the rights get assigned to the company. Um, so when you're, when you're looking at your portfolio um, and, and doing stuff, think about these timelines and, and how much it's going to cost you. There's this real you know, tendency, like we've got to file a whole bunch of provisional applications. We've got to get some IP right away. That's really important. We've got to lock up our ideas. And you may not be thinking about what's going to happen you know, way down the road. Um, so you've got you know, your, your application here. Maybe spending 15 grand doesn't sound too bad. OK, we can swing that. That's not too bad. You know, filing the PCT, that's no big deal. You know, okay, the PCT publishes, whoops, just lost all your trade secrets when that happens, so that's kind of key. And then you hit this nationalization date, and you may be up for 250K, and that's like, you know, that could be all of your scientific staff salaries, right? So, you know, do you want to be paying more techs to do work, you know, building prototypes or reducing things to, to practice in the lab? Or, or do that. So you really got to build that in, think about that, think way ahead, um, because you set this ball rolling. Um, so try and do selective patenting, figure out what should be patented, what should be a trade secret. There are some considerations there um, that you can read yourselves. Um, okay, choke points versus shotguns, we, we've talked about um, already. Um, Here's an example uh, of this. Um, so in order to produce some class of therapeutic compounds, um, you've got this huge class, right? So maybe there's 500 compounds that fall within this, and you're not even sure which ones are going to be particularly useful. Um, and if you try and file one patent application covering 500 different compounds, the patent office is going to issue something called a restriction requirement, which is going to require you to restrict your invention to one compound or a smaller class of compound, at least initially. You don't lose the rights to the others, but the patent office isn't going to look at all of that at once in one application, right? And you don't even know which ones to pick yet, right? Because it's, it, it's early on. Um, but if, you know, there, there's something that, that, that led you to this, that, that it was some, some chemical linkage that helped stabilize the structure or some synthetic step that allowed you to fuse a five member and a seven member ring you know, in a certain configuration or to get a certain chirality. Um, and that was the key step that led you to this class of compounds. Then they're irrelevant. And, and you don't have to worry about that. Go after that choke point. Go after an intermediate. So an intermediate in the synthesis that you had to do. Or let's say it's uh, stem cells. And um, you know, the, the, uh, the court has now made it fairly clear that isolated stem cells won't be patentable subject matter. What about their method of isolation? Did you find, you know, I found a suite of five cell surface markers that characterize this type of stem cell and no others. So patent the method of isolation using those you know, antibodies to those five markers. And that's just as good. It gets you where you're going because someone would have to go through that step to, to get to where you want to be. So look for those choke points. Um, Work with the patent attorneys to draft applications in-house. You all know how to write scientific papers. Patent application is sort of like a scientific paper, not quite, but um, you, you can do an iterative back and forth approach with the attorneys to keep your costs down. 
Um, same thing with responses. When we're arguing back and forth with the patent office, the examiner says it's obvious in light of reference A and reference B. You know that's nonsense. Write it up and explain it to the attorneys. Send them the arguments as to why that's not true. We'll reword it in, into legal jargon and, and send it to the patent office and save you a lot of money as opposed to us trying to figure it out. Um, okay. Um, so, how broad should your patent disclosure be? Um, let, me, let me jump one further. Um, no, I won't. Okay. Um, so, you, can, you, you don't want to start dumping into your disclosure all sorts of stuff that you haven't done yet. So, if you've accomplished step A, and you want to do it you know, as, as part of a, a larger process or you've got component A that's going to be part of a larger device um, and you start dumping all that other stuff in that you haven't done yet, what are you doing? Well, what you're doing is you're creating prior art. Your own publications can be prior art against you. So you invent, um, you invent you know, step A of the synthesis. Let's stay with the synthesis. Step A of the synthesis and then there's you know, B and C and D, which you got to get to somehow. You're not quite sure how. Um, and you, you put all that in your patent application. And um, the patent office finds that you've only enabled it up through intermediate A. You haven't really taught people how to make the other ones yet. So you're not entitled to the later steps in this patent application because you haven't done it yet. Then, a couple of years later, you figure out how to do the next steps. You file an application on that. Your first application has been published. It's prior art against you. It doesn't matter that you wrote it. It doesn't matter at all. Your own stuff is prior art against you. And it now acts as an obviousness reference against you and prevents you from getting the claims later. Okay? So think about whether or not you really need to do that. Um, and are you better off just going with, with something narrower at the start? Um, in terms of prosecuting claims, um, same sort of thing. When you're, when you're arguing with the patent office for very broad claims, very broad claims may encompass more art. There'll be more question about whether or not they're enabled. Do you want to have that fight now, spending a lot more money, a lot more attorney time arguing for broad claims, when a narrower claim would, would protect your commercial embodiment? You can go back for the broad claims later. You're not surrendering the right to have them. It's just what are you going to do first? Choose your battles, start your battles. I would, I'd recommend most cases, start more narrow. Yeah. So you were saying something that you could, you know, create your pri your own prior art, yeah. and that can prevent you from adding another patent. Mm -hmm. But I also heard if you put things into a patent applications, you may not necessarily need to claim it, and you can add claims later on based on that same patent application. So whatever mm -hmm. is in there, you could still claim at yes. a later time, right? Yes. So you can add claims which are adequately supported by the application. So if the application as filed has a written description which would enable one of ordinary skill in the art to make and use the invention without undue experimentation with a reasonable expectation of success, you can add claims to that later. If it's speculative and you're not sure <laughs> if it's going to work, and you haven't fleshed out the details, and the patent examiner says, like, well, you know, this is a suggestion that this is what you would do next, but you really haven't taught someone how to do it, I don't think they'd have a reasonable expectation of success. Having all that extra stuff in there does you no good. It creates prior art against you. It's now a motivation for someone else to do it, which is part of finding something obvious, is, is to find a motivation in the prior art. So you're, you're your specification can only support claims that, that meet that, that standard that I've repeated a bunch of times. Um, and you know, it has to convey to one of skill in the art, another way it's sometimes phrased is that you were in possession of the invention, that you had it. It's not that you wanted to be able to do it, that you had it, you could do it. One of skill in the art, it would reasonably convey to them that you were in possession at the time of filing of that invention. And that's often not the case. Like people will you know, come up with a protein and they'll wave their hands and they'll say, I claim this protein and conservative substitution variants thereof. No. <laughs> because you don't know what, you don't know what, we don't know what any, any one substitution is going to do. And, and the patent office is not going to let that issue. But you could do it strategically, what you said about narrowing the claim and 
Yes. Yes. So, so, so you can make this decision that I'm going to put in a broad disclosure, I'm going to prosecute the narrow claims. That broad disclosure could now be referred to as a defensive publication. I put that out there defensively. It may prevent me from getting a patent on it in the future because it's prior art to me, but it's prior art to everybody else as well. So I could make the, the strategic decision to put it out there, basically poison the well. There'll be no patents on the subsequent steps. But if I've got my choke point, that's all I need. And, and maybe it's more important to me to prevent someone from coming in with a dominating patent on one of my later steps um, down the road. So there's, there's a lot of strategy that, that, that is so case specific, I can't summarize it in slides. But. Um, timing of filing. So, you know, when do you file? Um, so in theory, as soon as the idea is concrete, and concrete in the sense that you would know how to make and use it and all of that, your filing of a patent application is called a constructive reduction to practice, a, a fictional reduction to practice. You've, it's as if you had made it. Um, but it still has to meet that requirement of conveying to the person of skill in the art that you're in possession and, and to allow them to make and use it. If you file too soon, you may wind up getting no patent and creating prior art. You could wait until you've actually got your commercial embodiment and it's working and it's exactly what you want to market. That might be too late. It could be that more prior art has come out, which is, could render your, your patent obvious, your claims obvious. A competitor may have done something in the intervening period, so you, don't, you can't sit on your rights too long. So uh, it's going to be a, a, a judgment call often. How, off, how long do you sit on it? And when do you pull the trigger that you want to file? Knowing that, once you pull that trigger, 18 months later, it's published, and it's out there, it's prior art, the trade secrets are gone. And my last point here is that, you know, to the extent inventions come in stages, think about doing the patents in stages as well. And there's no reason to describe the subsequent stages if it's not necessary. <laughs> Maybe you can just describe the intermediate or the module or whatever it might be, and then follow up later on. Um, International strategy, you just need to think about the markets. It's very product specific, company specific. If you're, you know, doing ag bio, you're going to want, you know, protection in Argentina. If you're doing pharmaceuticals, you might not. If you're doing software, you're going to want protection in Korea. You're not going to care that much about, you know, Portugal. Um, so you got to, this is just something for the business people and, and the attorneys to work through. What markets do you protect? Where are your competitors? Where are they manufacturing? Think not only about where sales are, but where manufacturing occurs. <laughs> Politics can be an issue. There are countries where you just, you know, it, it, they, they're unstable or it may, enforcement may not be realistic. And nobody has a crystal ball that's going to really tell you what to do for a, a patent that's going to last 20 years. 20 years from now, everything could be different. Um, all right, provisional applications. Okay, so how many, how many have like heard about provisional applications and, and such? All right, so. A provisional application is a patent application that can never turn into a patent by itself. You file it with the patent office, they stamp a date on it, they give it a serial number, it goes into a file, and they never do anything else with it. And one year later, they can throw it out. Um, or you can file an application that claims priority to it, that says, I'm now filing a, a regular application, a PCT application or a US non-provisional application. And I'm claiming back to that priority date. I disclosed my invention back then, so that's my place marker. So I'm entitled to a date a year before my, my non-provisional or PCT filing because I disclosed it then. Um, a lot of people use them, um, think that they can, they're, they're cheaper, right? Because they don't get examined. The filing fee is like 150 bucks, all right? You fill out a little form, it's fairly easy. Uh, all of clients will just draft them themselves and send them to me and tell me to file them, you know, and, and I'll do that. Um, but there are some things you, you need to know about them. So small filing fees, um, you've got to file within a year. The 20-year term is measured from the non-provisional date. Um, for pharma, this can add a year to your patent term. The most value is in the last years of the patent for a drug, usually, so that's good. You gain a year when it matters. The early years are eaten up in, in regulatory review. Okay, here's the siren song. So you've got these low filing fees and all these stuff. But the reality is, if the specification does not 
is not adequate to meet that standard, again, of enabling one of ordinary skill in the art to make and use the invention. If it doesn't, if it's not adequate to do that, then the priority date is not valid. So if you file some basically half-assed provisional application with poor disclosure, you know, just dashed off or you took a manuscript that's going off to nature and you s slap a cover on it and say this is a provisional patent application now, it is not going to get you a priority date because your patent claims aren't going to be in there and they're not going to look the same. They're going to be different words, <coughs> different description. What's in the paper is probably going to be very narrow. It's going to be exactly what you did in the lab. And if you used, you know, tr tris hydrochloride, two molar, whatever, um, your claims could get limited to exactly that, right? You're not going to be able to broaden it out. It's, it's going to be what you disclosed. So p part of what we do with a patent application is we take, the invent we, we take what you tell us about what you did, we try and find conceptually what's the inventive concept, capture that, broaden it as much as we can, trim away the stuff that's unnecessary, and try to get a patent claim that covers the inventive concept. Um, a, a quickly written up paper doesn't do that. It usually is the opposite. It is very focused on exactly what happened in the lab. Um, so a lot of people will file provisional applications. They are cheap, but they're not effective. I have a question back there. Um, I also, like, you know, have this tendency to give a false sense of security. Then people go off blabbing to investors and to, to other people, or they can feel like they can go off to a conference and talk about the invention because they filed a provisional application. But if the provisional doesn't secure you a real priority date, your speech at the conference just became more prior art against you and maybe another you know, self-inflicted wound here where you're, you're damaging your patent rights. Yes? Hi. Uh, under the, I'm sorry, I was under the impression that, um, that the content of a provisional patent was actually not public information for the one-year waiting period, and I just wanted to confirm that. Yeah, so if you abandon it, it never becomes public. But the moment you claim priority to it in, a, in another application, it becomes a public document. It won't be published, but it's accessible. So if I file a PCT application on the one-year anniversary, the U.S. Patent Office will, let's say, I use the uh, European uh, Receiving Office, right, for the PCT. They have to send a copy of the provisional over to the European Office so that they can check to see what you're claiming now and what you disclosed in the, in the provisional. And they have to match it and say, does this support what you're claiming now? And if your claims are broader than the disclosure here, they're not entitled to that filing date. So they have to examine it, and it becomes part of the public record. It won't be published, but it becomes part of the public record. And if you abandon it, you don't use the provisional as a pri priority date. Yeah, it just goes down into the wormhole. So it's, it's, no one will ever know what was in it. So that, that will be kept uh, confidential. Um, OK. So, so why is use? Uh, look, if there's an emergency filing, if a paper is about to publish, filing a provisional application, um, which is a copy of the manuscript, is better than nothing. Um, what it can do is it can remove the exact content of that manuscript from the prior art. All right, so that there's some, some advantage to that. It, you can defer prosecution costs for a year. That's a good idea for a startup always. Um, extend your 20-year term effectively by deferring the start of the, the count. That's good. Um, another reason to do it sometimes is just to uh, establish a, a, a priority date. If you're going into a collaboration with another company and you're both supposed to bring something to the table, the collaboration will often say, um, company a, a owns everything it owned before the collaboration, and company B owns everything it owned before the collaboration, but we'll jointly own what we developed together during the collaboration. Filing a provisional before the collaboration can be a way to it's like mailing you know, a letter to yourself, a way of establishing this was ours before we started working with you. So this is not collaboration IP. This was our existing IP before the start. It's sometimes done for that. Um, you know, and if there's a race to file, if you hear through the grapevine you know, from a referee of a paper that the other lab group in your area has submitted a manuscript and you think they're right on top of what you are doing, you know, and you're racing to get to the patent office, a provisional may be the way to do. Um, okay. <laughs> and, and, and provisionals are often used. There are no, no VCs here, are there? Um, there? You know, there are people who just count patents <laughs> and just say, oh, yeah, we have 12 provisional applications on file, and that sounds very impressive to people. You know, when you're doing a presentation, it sounds good. So you may want to file some just 
you know, to have some cheap PR, that you, you've got a patent portfolio. Um, okay, rolling provisionals. These are, uh, these are commonly used uh, in, in the health sciences in particular. People in, people in the tech industry have no idea why you would do this. They, they build something. When it works, they file an application, right? Um, in, in life sciences, you're working on things for years, trying to get them to, to work and to develop them. So what you might do is you file a provisional application, and if at the end of one year you haven't solved the problem, abandon it. File a new provisional application, adding in there whatever you figured out in the last year. If a year later you solve the problem, great. You know, file an application claiming priority to that provisional. If not, abandon it, file another one, and you just keep doing these rolling provisionals, okay? And you keep, keep refiling and refiling until you get to the point where you feel that I've got something. Um, and, and that way you've always got something on file. If a publication so suddenly comes out that would be prior art, you can use one of your pending provisionals for a priority date, and at least you're protecting whatever it is you had as of that time. So you don't lose everything, all right? So it's a, it's a good way rather than just, you know, it totally deferring filing, file in this fashion. Um, so one after another, et cetera. Um, so again, if a third party publication appears, then you can file based on that. Um, that's what I just said. You could also do it if you, if you really want to uh, maintain your trade secret as long as possible. You can just keep filing provisional applications. No one's figured it out yet. So I'll just keep rolling along my provisional applications, and then if somebody else discovers your trade secret, you say, aha, I've already filed on that, and I've got a date b before then. Um, okay. Um, but you wind up with some self-inflicted wounds here um, that can happen. You might find out that you know, you're filing every 12 months, but applications are only published um, you know, every 18, after 18 months. So party A is filing every 12 months. They abandon their last one. Six months after they abandon it, they see party B's PCT application publishes. And that means that they filed 18 months before. Their priority date was 18 months before, six months before you abandoned. Um, and you'll just realize that you'll, you, lost, you, know, you lost your gamble there in terms of not filing uh, and, and relying on it. So it happens, that's the risk you have to look out for. Uh, and it really just is impossible to be aware of all the prior art out there. So even if you think you know it, it might be out there, you think you're safe, you abandon your provisional rights and refile, and it turns out that there is the dissertation in Hungarian in the one library in Budapest. Um, omnibus provisionals are a, a personal bugaboo of mine. Um, so you, you had asked about, you know, what happens with the provisional application? Is it maintained in, in secrecy? And yes, unless or until you claim priority to it. So some people will just do this huge brain dump omnibus provisional application. They'll take every idea that the company has, they put it all down uh, on paper, and they'll just file one application, and, and here is everything we, we know and, and, and think. And a year later, it might be that of the 20 ideas described in there, you've made progress, enough progress on one for it to be worth filing a patent application on, all right? But when you claim priority to it, the whole thing becomes public. So the other 19 inventions have just been thrown into the public domain. So you can't do that. So these, the, this idea of this big giant provisional where you do a brain dump is an awful idea. You should either never claim priority to it and just use it to puff up your portfolio for investors. Or the, the better strategy is you break things up where you wouldn't mind them all going into the public domain at once. And that's how you should, you should look at it. Um, okay, so there's the um, self-inflicted wound. PCT application, so the PCT is a placeholder application, it's an international application, it gets a preliminary examination, it gets a preliminary report on patentability from examiners, but a patent doesn't issue from it. That preliminary examination report goes to all the different patent offices when you nationalize, it has some influence on them, it's not dispositive. If the PCT examiner says it's patentable, it doesn't matter, each country can come to their own conclusion. You will find things are found obvious in France, but not obvious in England. There's not much you can do. Um, 
they, they kick out your expenses to 30 or 31 months, so there's an advantage in that. You get a preliminary examination report, which is actually very valuable because you'll get at least an examiner has looked at it and, and given you a sense of whether or not it's patentable before you make that decision to spend a quarter million dollars. You can look at it and, and see the best prior art that they could find and the best arguments that they could find and maybe you'll decide this is not worth the investment um, because they found a lot of art we are unaware of or they're unpersuaded uh, about the patentability. Let's cut our losses uh, and run. Um, so the, the deferred nationalization here pushes back the issuance of the patent. You know, th that's very important for the, uh, the tech industry because, again, you know, product obsolescence and, and things are moving so fast. Generally not an issue in, in the health sciences, at least not as much. Um, okay. Don't dump your business plan into your first application. Uh, I think we've talked about that. You should only put in what's enabled. Um, we've kind of talked about that. And... Yeah, premature filing. Again, don't file something before it's um, enabled. And we've got an example here, which may be a little hard to follow, but think about this. So I've got uh, in vitro studies, and I show that a compound uh, binds to cell surfaces to a receptor. That receptor is linked to disease. Okay. And I immediately say, aha, well, this is a candidate now, you know, for um, curing this disease. I, don't have any data on that, but it's a candidate. You rush out there, you file a, 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 a PCT that claims provisional to, uh, claims priority to a provisional year earlier, um, and you claim methods of treating the disease. And the patent office says, you've got no data on treating the disease. All you have is that this thing, you know, binds to the receptors. And that's not enough to, to, to treat. Um, so they won't give the patents. Okay, so you do more research and you find out, yes, in fact, the binding does inhibit this and it does act as a, as a treatment for the disease. You file a new application, but your first one published and it's prior art against you. And the patent office can on the one hand find that your first one is non-enabling so you can't get a patent, yet it discloses enough to render your subsequent application obvious. You don't get a patent on that either. You get nothing. Um, so you shouldn't be going out there describing or claiming things that you can't back up that aren't enabled. You're just creating prior art against yourself and, and you, you can set up a situation like this. Um, so if, if you think about sort of what I said about the inventions coming in, in stages, maybe you can do something else. Um, so if I have studies that show the compound can bind to a cell surface, okay. Um, so. So first, I claim some in vitro utility, okay? So maybe it's a marker of those cells. So I'm claiming my compound, not for treatment of disease, but it's a marker for those cells because it will bind to the receptor and it will highlight the cells that are expressing that receptor. That could have some utility. It could be, you know, tumor-specific antigen or whatever it might be. So I claim that first. Right before that's published, now maybe I file my application claiming treatment of the disease. It's not, the first one's not prior art to me because I'm filing right before it's published. I bought myself some time during that 18 month, I've had 18 months more to do research and support my subsequent claims to a method of treatment. So the invention came in stages. I found the first, first I discovered this, fine, patent that. Later, you've got to make the next step and when you've got that, do your next filing. Um, I'm going to leave some more time for, I'm uh, running out of time for questions, so let's see. Um, okay. So uh, let's just open it up uh, for any general questions or. Anybody else? You've asked too, all right. Just trying to spread the love. No, I have a, just a quick question <coughs> about trade secrets. When, um, so you're going to the VCs and you go to a number of angels or VCs mm -hmm. and you have not filed a patent and you have trade secrets. Now you can ask them to sign an NDA, which they are reluctant to do, but even if they do, I mean, you know, you're basically kissing a lot of frogs. Yep. And each frog knows your trade secret. Yeah. What do you do? Uh, so it, it's, a, it's a great question. I mean, they, they won't sign CDAs. They don't, they, don't, they, they, they don't want to be, they don't want to deal with it. They don't want to have to keep track of it. 
and it puts you at risk, and you're absolutely right. I mean, you think about a VC that looks at 100 companies a year, and yours is one of them, but they don't fund you, and then the next year they look at another 100 companies, they pick one to fund that's doing something similar to what you did, and they think they have a great idea, and they suggest, why don't you try this? They don't even remember that they got it from you, and they wind up passing on your trade secret, and you're exposed. And the answer is, they've got the money, you need the money, you bear the risk. I mean, that's basically it. There's, there's, there's no answer. I mean, you can, you can plead for them to file a CD, uh, to sign a CDA with you, a confidential disclosure agreement. Um, but most of them will refuse. And if you don't like that, then you, know, you can go find another angel or another VC, but they'll probably do the same thing. Uh, it's just a, dispar it's a disparity of bargaining power issue. And, and there's, there's nothing much to do about it. Yeah, I have a question about your um, omnibus uh, provisional. Mm -hmm. Let's say you had 20 of your ideas uh, dumped on this provisional, and you actually then filed a uh, non-provisional for one of them. Um, do the other 19, first of all, does that then become, does that provisional now get published, or in, including all, and, and does that get published 12 months or 18 months mm -hmm. after? And so therefore, if, you, if it does become public, you still have six months to polish off the other 19 Claims, if yeah. you will. It's not, it's not ever published, but becomes publicly available. 12 months or 18 months. At the time of filing, the day you file. The day you file something claiming priority to it, you have m made it a public document. Now, no one in, in reality will be able to get it right away because they won't know that you filed. And so there's a reality component to it. So that when, you're, when your PCT publishes at 18 months, that's when people will probably first become uh, a, aware of your priority claim, at that point they can then go to WIPO and request a copy of the provisional. It'll even take a while for, uh, it may ultimately get lo loaded into a database so that it can be downloaded. But, and that may take longer than 18 months. But the, the legal fiction is maintained that the date of filing was the date that you agreed to make it public, so as of that date it's, a pu it's public. It's like things that are available through the Freedom of Information Act. It can take seven years to get them, but they're always publicly available, so it's not when someone gets it, it's when they could theoretically have gotten it. Mm 